Hello and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown and I'm joined as usual by Managing Director of Guns on Pegs, Chris Horn. Chris, it's been quite a while since we've done one of these. Yeah, so it's about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've we've been really busy though, George, and um, I, I'm, I'm kind of proud of why we've been busy. Uh, so I, I think... If, I mean, well, I'll say for, for for listeners. Hopefully, some of you uh, will have seen that we've 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 gone and launched something. Uh, we've done a thing, as Clarkson would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but but yeah, George and I have been really busy uh, working on a project, uh, and it's it's a new app called the Game Card, um, which is essentially a digital magazine for the field sports community. So behind the scenes, beavering away for, for, for quite a large part of 2021, actually. And then up until recently, we've been working away on developing this. And it's it's an open platform where you can read stories from the field sports community and where expert and, and also undiscovered voices can share their thinking. So it's cool. I'm really proud of what we've done as a team there, actually. So what do you reckon, George? Yeah, it's been seriously hard work, particularly like since Christmas. It's been pretty full on. but it looks fantastic. I'm really pleased with it. Maybe tell everyone why we, yeah, tell, tell everyone why we did it. I think that's important. Yeah. So there's kind of two main reasons. The first is that, as we know from doing the podcast, this world is full of people with great stories to tell, loads of expertise and skills and strong opinions. But it's actually quite difficult for them to find somewhere to express those opinions. You've got social media, it can be a bit of a bun fight. The magazines, it's quite difficult to get into. Um, you know, they've got limited space, that kind of stuff. So we wanted to create a platform where people can express themselves, but also to make it possible for the wider field sports audience to find them. So the game card's going to be a digital magazine uh, for anybody who's got a passion for field sports, you know, the countryside, the outdoor lifestyle, all that kind of stuff. And an, uh, present an opportunity for anybody with a desire to create something and build an audience and that kind of thing to do so. Our, our guest today is actually the per- the perfect sort of person to 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 have a profile on this platform. Uh, but the um, what a segue! You've got to keep going with that. Tell us who the guest is. <laughs> well, I, well, I, before I did, I just wanted to really emphasize what you were just saying there because it's really nice. I, sp- I don't think you've ever told me about what our app is, and it's just nice to hear it because <laughs> it does make total sense. And it is an open platform, and 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 anyone can have an author profile and and share their their musings, and 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 as long as it meets. Uh, you know our sort of editorial guidelines uh then then it's good to go as long as it doesn't get us sued basically yeah but <laughs> exactly that <laughs> yeah so yes anyway yeah our, our guest today um we've got we've got a proper champion with us uh and actually she's the Ineos Grenadier countryside champion that you might have seen uh well certainly we've talked about we obviously we, we had Toby Equia from from Ineos on the podcast and we were talking about it then so our guest today grew up on a croft, uh, and she was a vegetarian for the first eighteen years of her life. Um, and and after a Damascene moment, she she became a professional deer manager and has has worked t- uh, taking guests stalking. These days, she works uh, as a deer management officer for Nature Scott. So there's already a ton to talk about. Um, she's very active on social media. Uh, highlighting the positive impact of deer management for communities and the environment. And she actively encourages women and girls to enter the rural sector. She regularly appears on TV, radio and print. A uh, massive, huge warm welcome from George and I and all of our listeners to Megan Rowland. God, that's a hell of an intro. <laughs> <laughs> I think when you hear it all like that, nice to, nice to be with you guys. <laughs> it's great to have you with us. Put you on a pedestal right there, haven't we? I know, I know. <laughs> I just think, wonder if I can live up to that. <laughs> I don't, I think I don't think that's even mentioned everything has it I you're being too modest I think No it's not <laughs> that's, really, <laughs> that's really embarrassing thank you Well con- congratulations on the award Cheers Chris Yeah no re- really good it was it was a fascinating pro- pro- uh, process doing going through the nominations for the countryside champion we had some weird and wonderful nominations and then we it culminated for for those of you that haven't heard about this too much it culminated in this judging day in london a few weeks back uh, where we had leaders and chairmen and ceos of, of major bodies within our industry and we george put together the bios on the shortlist the six on the shortlist and we had 
two and a half hours of proper passionate debate about who's worthy. And it turns out that you were the unanimous winner, which was nice. It meant that we didn't have to go long into the evening to just try and to try and fight one out. That's that's lovely. That's nice to hear. It's, um, yeah, it's a bit weird to hear that about yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> I but, can imagine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I'm delighted. I mean, it was such a surprise because I didn't know I'd be nominated in the first place until I got a phone call and then it, to actually win as well is kind of really, really, yeah, I'm <laughs> still a bit overawed by the whole thing. One of those slightly weird things about um, the sort of public nomination way of doing the awards, isn't it? That, you know, some of the kind of industry award things, you kind of have to nominate yourself. Whereas with this, you know, it's been a, it was a completely open, you know, just fill out the form and tell us who you think deserves to win. Yeah, probably most of the nominees had no idea that they'd been nominated. I did, I did when I was looking through some of the nominations, I noticed that one or two people were getting huge numbers of nominations and I thought something fishy is going on here. Somebody, <laughs> somebody sent this out to their entire syndicate or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we had lots of nominations for very well-known characters. So uh, there was we actually created an Outstanding Achievement Award um, which was which was voted for by the judges from all the sort of really famous people because the whole point of this was about unsung heroes like yourself people doing a really good job behind the scenes that we need to celebrate and the the winner of the outstanding achievement award as voted for by the judges was was Jeremy Clarkson and Caleb Cooper after what they've done for I think rural way of life really I think that and we've there's a fair amount of agreement on that one so I think that's a good call definitely. yeah. <laughs> So I saw the other day Clarkson has launched a beer, which I think we yes, need to have that. on this uh, podcast at some point. But since we haven't got it today, Megan, why don't you tell us what's that you're drinking? I'm drinking a can of Heineken because I'm a classy kind of gal. <laughs> 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 and it's a Wednesday night and alongside that I'm having a cup of tea because it's been one of those kind of days. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, don't judge me. It's... um. It's Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah, it's Wednesday. It's midweek. I think that's allowed. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Cup of tea and a can of Heineken. That, yeah. tells, that, tells, yeah. that says a lot about your day, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of, um, we've been trying to get Chris's dad to write us a column about his pigeon shooting escapades. He goes and sits in the pigeon hide with a can Squirt. of Stella and a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and I want I want him to write us this column called A Stella and a Cigar. <laughs> I quite like that. <laughs> I no, I, I wouldn't want to I'm normally I mean dram, drams are normally the the thing of choice, the uh, the stipple of choice, you know, living in the Highlands. You've got to you've got to like whiskey even a little bit. Um yeah. but I think mid midweek's probably a bit much for that. Uh, not for George. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment. George, <laughs> it's, what it's are you doing? It's a school note for me. <laughs> As is traditional, I've got a nice glass of Speyside single malt, um, and this one is bottled at forty-eight percent. So um, I'm going to have night. a very, yeah, going to have a very enjoyable Wednesday evening. Get on you. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. If you, you haven't had this one before, then uh, it is one I've had before. It's an Abalauer, which is um, a distillery I've sort of fallen in love with recently, and it just ha- so happens to be one just down the road from where we fish at Arndilly. So yeah, I, I know bring back several cases this summer and take Waitrose out of the equation. Nice. Uh, so I try very hard not to have the same drink twice. I think I've only done it once. But today I slightly messed up. So I was in a meeting uh, with British Game Assurance at lunch. Uh, we were discussing various different things. And I text Flo from this meeting saying, shit, I forgot to put a drink. My, this is my wife. I forgot to put a drink in the fridge. Can you have a rummage around and see what you find? So this is a surprise for me as much as it is for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can what I've what she's found. I didn't know we owned, and it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got there? So, Baby jam. Uh, so I no, it, it's similar. Uh, so <laughs> I, it's a it's a horrible bottle of Merry Down cider, but it's one of those sort of very light. Shouldn't really be cider ciders and 6.8 percent it kind of looks uh, like someone drank it before you did yeah and then put it back in the cup (laughs) in (laughs) through the lower yes (laughs) anyway (laughs) um yeah it's it's horrible but anyway it's a podcast well i feel like i'm winning (laughs) oh absolutely you are there's no there's no competition there at this point (laughs) i think i don't know how many liters of of megan's drink and my drink we need to combine to make sort of one dram of yours in value 
Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go slowly. <laughs> Right. So, Megan, the next segment uh, is a fan favorite. It's the uh, segment we call Whose Bird Is It Anyway? And it's when we ask our loyal listeners to write in with their shooting and stalking and fishing quandaries and queries. um, And we do our level best to help them out. Uh, We always keep the correspondents anonymous so that they don't get into trouble with their friends uh, or family. Uh, So this one comes from somebody I've decided to call Wolfie. And Wolfie writes, Dear George and Chris, this is not so much a whose bird is it anyway, but more a the only only bird the entire day sort of dilemma. Recently, I attended a shooting trip with my husband, a perfect chance for a weekend without children and the opportunity to spend some quality time together whilst also visiting a part of the UK we'd not been to before. My husband and I enjoy a weekend away every year rather than buying each other Christmas presents. Each year, we take it in turns to choose a location, and this year, it was his turn to choose. It soon became abundantly clear that he was planning another shooting trip. Being together for 17 years, I knew what he was thinking, and the inevitable question was asked by my husband, why don't we combine both and enjoy a pleasant weekend away? I must mean pleasant mention... weekend away. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> I think that probably would have been less likely to get the all clear. Um <laughs> So she goes on, I must mention at this point that I enjoy my countryside pursuits, horse riding, hunting, picking up, beating, etc. But I don't shoot. However, I'm always keen to get involved on shoot days, driving the game cart, cooking and just enjoying days out with family and friends. I've never stopped my husband from enjoying his shooting activities. And now our son is older. It's a great chance to spend quality family time together with the dogs in the field. However, this shooting trip would be with a team of guns we barely knew, only meeting a couple of them once before. My husband's shooting trip was sold to me as a chance to meet new people and make new friends. There'd be plenty of other guns, wives and partners to meet and enjoy the weekend with, especially when undoubtedly the conversation would turn to talking about gun makes, shot and gram size, bag sizes, and of course, the lasting debate on steel. Knowing there'd be solidarity between the added guests, I hesitantly agreed to our trip away. Imagine my face when we all met for dinner the night before to find not a single other lady, wife or partner had joined the party. I was the only lady. The evening was fantastic despite the lack of female support. We all chatted, ate and drank late into the night the night and the following day the shoot was fantastic and everyone made me feel so welcome. It truly is what this lifestyle is all about. Now the dilemma. I shan't let this go forgotten. But what should I be expecting from my husband? This was clearly a well-planned shooting trip, along with a failed attempt at our yearly weekend child-free getaway. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions. Oh, payback. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'd imagine this is not an (laughs) uncommon occurrence around the, the country. No, Definitely not. I bet it happens all the time, and I'm definitely guilty of doing this too. You sell the dream because what you want is <laughs> is very exciting, but then you realise halfway through it just definitely wasn't quite exci- as exciting for her. <laughs> what do you reckon, Megan? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been the only lady on a, on shoot days before now, um, so I can I kind of feel the pain there, especially when you've been sold it as a good way to meet other people, like-minded people. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find out you're the kind of the only one. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a bit challenging. I'm not sure what would be a, a suitable. What would what should she be expecting now? I mean, at the very least, it's got to be another weekend away, right? Proper weekend, like whatever she wants yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. I think that's not unfair. <laughs> as extravagant as he wants to be. <laughs> I mean, it's worth pointing out, like a shoot day is not a cheap operation either. So she's got some budget to play with. <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> because I've been in that situation before where everyone says, oh, all other halves welcome. And you think by receiving that, oh, they really do mean that. And they do mean it. It's just that not everyone takes it up. So it's inevitable that this happens every so often. And it's tricky because, you know, husband here has obviously got the best of intentions and hats off to him. It's just that the others didn't and they let him down. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, well, this is what, yeah. So, so Wolfie needs to, she should definitely be expecting, you know, I'd say a trip abroad somewhere, really, <sighs> I think. We're, we're, we're really, <clears throat> we're really chucking him under the bus there. Aren't we? Yeah. Husband sends the bill to all the other people who are on the shoot day. 
divided by eight, divided by buttons. seven. Yeah, for dropping him in it. Or at least next time he sees them, it sounds like they had a good day, so that could happen, right? Next time he sees them, they all buy him a drink. Yeah, actually, that could end up really badly. That's like nine drinks. <laughs> that's going the wrong way. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, why is he being rewarded with free drinks here? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, that's going the wrong way, isn't it? All by her. <laughs> no, but the fair, to be fair, I actually, uh, you're, I'm arguing, has he done anything wrong? I, that's what I'm saying. Like the other guns have let him down slightly. I I have a feeling that he was probably stretching the definition of a weekend away without the kids. <laughs> and uh, let's put it like this: if if it were me. I think I'd be looking to to make up for it somehow. Yeah, I th- no. yeah. I think it's not unfair to make amends of sorts, especially as we missold a weekend away. I mean, it's not like you don't want to, you know. It's not like you won't enjoy it, but it's not what you thought you were going for. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's like ordering a. It's like ordering a nice rare steak and it coming well done. Yeah, or kind of <laughs> at least medium rare. So sort of, it's all right, but. Yeah, it's not what you wanted. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I feel slightly sorry for him here because I do feel like I, I feel like I've been in the situation. He had the best of intentions, and the problem is when he when he when he pitches the same thing again this year, he's just going to be laughed out the room, isn't he? It's for just, sure. <laughs> and and we we don't know that he really didn't just want a nice weekend away with his partner and all the rest of it. And yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm feeling more and more sorry for him the more I think about it. <laughs> so should he do anything? I don't know. It's a tough one. I'm not sure we've offered much advice as ever. Yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> confident that we failed, um, but that's par for the course. Right, so Chris, let's move swiftly on then because we've we've properly failed. But uh, have you got a, an unpopular opinion for us this time? I do. Um, well, sort of, anyway. It, it falls somewhere between an unpopular opinion and a dilemma. Uh, and it comes from someone that we shall call Clarence, who writes... I run a notable shooting club in the Northeast USA. I've been running very successful pheasant and duck shoots for a number of years and have even been shooting in the UK several times. My wife has been bugging me about trying to find a job over there, so over here, and even if for a short while, and move move the family over as well. And I must say, I'm not entirely against it. My question is this. I've got a bunch of questions already, but anyway, my question is this. Uh, Has an American ever run a shoot in the UK? Is this even allowed? Would he be taken seriously or would he ruin the authenticity of the shoot? I have to admit, if I were to travel all the way to Scotland for a shoot and upon the first day we're to meet a keeper from, say, Texas, I might have second thoughts about my decision. (laughs) Curious as to your thoughts, does an American have a place in the UK shooting world other than as a gun? This is... This is That's a good quite question. cool. I like this. Yeah. Just thinking about the husband and wife scenario from the previous dilemma, right? This wife is saying, darling, I think we should go move to the UK and you should run a shoot. <laughs> Do you think that's what she said? Well, it sounds like it. Is she envisaging living in the middle of nowhere on a shooting estate or is she envisaging living in Knightsbridge? Um... <laughs> I think at this point it's That's really important. Question. It's really important he manages her expectations because if he ends up in the same boat as Wolfie's other half did, then he's in serious trouble because it's not like just a weekend, right? <laughs> right. There's an important question. I want to go straight to you, Megan, because he's he's painted the scenario here. Uh, he's he's saying, you know, if he turned up in Scotland and the and the shoot host was from Texas, how would you feel? So has an American ever run in the shoot in UK? Is this even allowed? So so what would you think if you rocked up to a shoot in Scotland and the, you had some bloke in a pair of cowboy boots and a Stetson saying yee to you on the arrival? It'd be, it'd be really quite novel. <laughs> it'd be quite something. I think the biggest thing for them would be the culture shock, actually, because it's such a different style of operations. Well, I, mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's certainly... Certainly, liven up a shoot day if nothing else. Like it would, wouldn't it? I hat think it... And cowboy boots. Exactly. Spurs jingling. <laughs> I mean, we've taken it slightly far there. We have, we're not not suggesting that he wouldn't buy himself a nice pair of wellies or something. But... No, I think no, wellies would have cold. to be banned on his shoot. Yeah, yeah. Cowboy boot, snakeskin cowboy boots only. Now we're talking, or alligator at the very least. <laughs> It's an interesting point, though, isn't it? Because, like, if if you go for the authenticity of a shoot, and you're expecting, you know, some 
local yokel to be running the shoot, then maybe put your stamp on it. Yeah. A shoot is is nothing without the people running it, right? That's what makes them unique. It's what makes them different. And yeah, I, I also... So one question, is it even allowed? I don't think there's a law against it. So that's fine. Ultimately, it's going to come down to whether it's a good shoot or not, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I I definitely think there would be people who'd find it a bit odd. And I mean, he's got to run a good... He's just got to run a shoot well, right? So... And it does take a bit of experience and know-how over the years. And if this is his first driven shoot, then it doesn't matter where he's from, he's going to struggle. Yeah. But, I mean, interestingly, so it's it. there is that kind of traditional aspect of it, isn't there? But I know, for example, there's an Icelandic guy who gillies on the spay. He might have just retired, actually, but certainly for quite a long time there was a chap called Ori who was, who was uh, gillying on the spay. Megan, do you know of any non-UK origin stalkers uh there's a guy that wrote from me i think he's i think he's danish i don't want to get his national he's scandinavian definitely but i, I think i'm pretty sure he's danish um and yeah delivers and stalks away and loves living here and yeah he's a grand guy good neighbor um yeah this is the odd person like i said there's no there's no laws against it <laughs> it's not, you're not barred at the, the door <laughs> the, the difference there is like Doing a bit of stalking out in Denmark or Scandinavia or whatever is pretty similar in many ways to what you're doing in Scotland. I think the difference here is like if you're doing walked up quail in Texas and you want to come and run a high bird shoot in Scotland, like that's so that's very shock. different. It's a very different yeah, that, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, they are, yeah, they are different different things, aren't they? But you know, the Americans yeah. are keen on their conservation. They're keen on their. I mean, they don't call it gamekeeping, but it kind of is a lot of the stuff that goes on so uh, i don't i you know it comes it's going to come down to how the shoot day pans out isn't it you're going to turn up and he's there in his stetson and his snakeskin boots <laughs> and you're going to go can... oh crikey what have i let myself in for here but if the birds are good and the hosting's good and everything's run in the way that it should be you're just going to talk to your mates about it you'll never believe who was running this shoot <laughs> I think he, but the, he also alludes to it, doesn't he? I might have second thoughts about my decision is what he said. So he's already cut out the American market who want to go and stay with Lord so-and-so in Scotland, don't they? Uh, and Rather than stay with a bloke from down the road that they could have seen at home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, fair point. Yeah. I also wonder, like, you know, when like, you go to, a, I don't know if you'd like look at sports teams and they're like bought out by an American owner, you think, oh, money, like he's just, commercializing this i'd worry that that might come across but he's got to try hard i think put his own stamp on it like you said george yeah blaze orange everywhere (laughs) yeah we've talked about that before haven't we (laughs) yeah not a good look anyway so i think if he if he fancies it come and have a go get your shoot up on guns or pegs we'll sell you a few pegs oh we'll talk about it for sure everyone's (laughs) got to try yeah we look forward to our invitation that too (laughs) right so usually at this point we'd have our shooting hero segment but because we've got our own real life actual superhero with us on the podcast i thought we might dispense with that for this episode keep some of the submissions we've had for future episodes and just have a chat with megan what do you think chris yeah good idea but keep them coming i love the ones we get in there's some really good ones in there uh, yeah. Do keep them coming, because even if they don't get read out on air, George and I share them between each other. We enjoy reading them, so thank you. Great. Okay, so before we do that, uh, I'll just remind everybody that Wolfie and Clarence and, of course, now Megan are members of the Most Noble Order of the Garters and will soon be in receipt of a set of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast, Shooting Sock Garters. If you have a shooting confession, quandary, or query that you'd like us and our guests to help you with, or you've got an unpopular opinion or you would like to nominate a hero, do just drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. Now then, Megan, right at the beginning, we mentioned that you were a vegetarian for the first 18 years of your life. Can you tell us the story of how you've ended up as a professional deer manager? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a rambling one. Um... That's just what this podcast's for. <laughs> oh, perfect. Found my people. <laughs> So, um, yeah, brought up vegetarian. There was no real reason. I think my parents just decided to stop eating meat one day, and that was that. There wasn't really any kind of major ethical kind of reason behind it. It was just one of those things they decided to do. So um, you had it sort of forced upon you in a way. You just, pretty it much, just was something, yeah, yeah. It was just the thing. I mean, I didn't really think anything of it 
good or bad or indifferent kind of thing. Um, it just was. And uh, I think because I'd always been vegetarian, I didn't really think I was missing out on anything. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that was that. And then my my younger brother, he started eating meat while he was at, you know, at school and that sort of thing, sort of like sneaking sausage rolls. Um, <laughs> and it's sort of become like a, a sort of thing where he started eating it and then mum and dad sort of started eating meat again. And they decided to have some of their own, um, their own red breed sheep because they had the croft and they'd previously just rented out the land to a farmer down the road beforehand. So they got some of their own sheep. And I'd sort of been looking at, you know, sort of left school by this point and was sort of wondering what, what to do, looking at conservation and thinking about, you know, the environment. And I think I remember sitting there one day with my sort of like corn, whatever it was for supper and, uh, and they're having, you know, roast, you know, roast mutton or lamb or whatever from a sheep that had sort of come out of the field. You know, I'd literally seen it from lamb right the way through to the, to the plate. And I'm sitting there thinking, hang on, maybe there's, you know, I'm eating something that's been sort of produced somewhere. I don't know. I've had no in like it was it was a lot to do with kind of like traceability and accountability for what on your plate and it, that kind of got me started thinking on that and uh after that point I thought right okay I will try a little bit and see how it goes and I thought that's just quite nice I think I'll eat more <laughs> I think I'll eat more of it um right okay but made this kind of you know kind of had the thing that I would eat meat that was as far as possible from like stuff that I could trace to the producer or, you know, stuff that friends would produce to family. And that, you know, so that was, that was that. And, uh, I moved down to the Highlands in, what would it be? 2012. Moved down for uni. I was studying at University of Hounds and Islands. I was doing environmental science at that point. And I was about 18 months into this degree and it was just not the right direction at all. It was just the wrong, wrong time, wrong fit to one of those things. And I thought, right, okay, I'll come out of this and uh, I'll go and do some volunteering because I don't, I don't have a clue really what I want to do. I was just doing a degree for the sake of that's what you do when you finish school. Um, went and did a lot of volunteering with like RSPB Scotland and Game Wildlife Conservation Trust and did some bits of Bob's Scottish Mink Initiative and a whole heap of other people, basically. Um, just all around the Scottish Wildlife Trust and just to get a good a, a range of experience. And uh, it was my colleague at the RSPB, my boss at the RSPB, who um, took me out stalking the first time. We'd been going up to do surveys early one morning and uh, passed a group of stags at the side of the road. I said, you know, I'd quite like to, you know, if I'm going to eat meat, I think, I, I think I need to do it all field to fork. I'd quite like to go stalking and, you know, do it myself and just see if I, see if I can, you know. <laughs> um, can I actually press the button and put something through into the larder? And yeah, I'm actually quite interested in that whole process. I didn't really think much of it. And he sent me a text saying, do you want to go out stalking at the weekend? I went, yeah, right then. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and uh, got geared up, went out, out for the whole day. You know, there was a couple of stalks didn't work out. And finally it sort of like, you know, close a play, managed to get in on a stag and, and took the shot. And, and uh, I was, I think I was surprised. I think because like when you're, when you're exposed to a lot of like the anti-hunting stuff is very emotive like it, there's a lot of emotional kind of play because that's you know they're animals and it, it hits people differently and I was amazed at like taking the shot for the first time how little emotion there was and how very like clinical the whole thing was you know to taking the shot through to processing it to putting it in the larder you know it was a very like clinical process I was actually quite amazed by that I thought oh, okay there's a bit more to this whole thing than I've and there's, there's not that sort of surge for, yeah. of bloodlust that, that no. the sort of anti-shooting, no. anti-hunting propaganda might not have led you to believe happens. Not at all. It turns exactly. you instantly into a sort of... <laughs> Slavering maniac. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. Yes. laughs> I'm sure it happens to some people, but no, it wasn't my experience. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so that was kind of um, got me started thinking, hang on, maybe this, maybe this is something I could get a bit more into started out then doing a little bit more sort of looking into getting a bit more upskilled in the whole sort of field sports sector did my like D dmq level one then worked for a season down on a pheasant shoot down in perthshire i've been sort of doing beating and picking up and you know just kind of scooting about with my dog just trying to make connections and meet people and see if there's any work going and i uh, got a job for a season on a pheasant shoot it's really interesting good experience 
I, I decided that at that point that pheasants weren't for me. I, they're definitely for some people, some folks, like that's just their vocation. But I thought, no, deer, deer are where I want to be at. And uh, came back up to Sutherland and applied to go to North Highland College and uh, do the gamekeeping and wildlife management course there. So I did that for two years. And that course is kind of one of these things where you're at college for sort of blocks of time, a couple of weeks, a few weeks in the year, but the rest of it's on an estate working and doing the job. So, yeah, that was, uh, so that how was long kind of was, where it's at. How long was the gap between <laughs> that first stalk and the yep. decision to go off and do a deer management qualification and think of it as a potential career path? <laughs> about two days <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that's no, it's it quite was, a transformation it was, yeah. isn't it it was kind of a, it was I uh, sort of gave me a lot of food for thought and then I, th- I kind of thought oh, okay right okay let's maybe maybe start looking into this a little bit more a little bit more seriously yeah it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a long turnaround <laughs> but um I think if the bug bites you then you're, you're, you're kind of done for yeah so when when things. Chris described it as a Damascene moment in the intro i mean it really was as pretty, as pretty extent, much yeah. as close to that as you can get really yeah yeah to be honest it really yes. was um, but it, it's, mad, so it's mad. So, so, so you're a vegetarian and the rspb take you out stalking and yeah. <laughs> and then all of us and then all of a sudden you're a deer manager i mean like literally oh, yeah, ho- said no one ever <laughs> yeah and i'm become a poster girl for the country sports thing the rspb be shocked at that <laughs> we've cre- but created I'm, this monster I'm, I'm, I wanted to ask about the RSPB. Obviously, they get enormously bad rep, and a lot of it's very justified. But you, you must have seen more in depth than the proper, you know, the media would suggest. I mean, is it is it is it all justified or not? It's it's like yeah. all these things. It's like <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't be careful what I say because I work, I work with the civil service now, and I've got to be very sensible. But it's like all these things. There's uh, the, there's a lot of bureaucracy. Once an organisation gets to a certain size. And especially with the membership organization, because they're reliant on people, you know, putting money in, they have to be very wary of how they present and what they present. And so there's a lot of folks on the ground who want to actually work together and get quite frustrated when, you know, the the view that has to be doesn't tie up with reality. Um, that's not to say everybody's great to work with. Some people are just difficult, regardless of w- <laughs> what sector they work in. Yeah. To be fair, but yeah, um, I, yeah. I can understand that because 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 back in the day, you know, the, the shooting community was was the, the, among the biggest supporters of the RSPB. And actually, in many ways, I'd love to try and support. I'd love to support the RSPB if I didn't hate them. But you know, I, 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 save I, your superlatives. <laughs> But I would, because, you know, I sit here with, like, I've got a little list of birds I've seen out the window in my binoculars and stuff like that. I mean, that's more than most RSPB members do, probably. But, yeah, it's just the mismatch of what drives membership, isn't it? Totally. Um, I think it's quite sad because there is such a crossover between, like, you know, I mean, anybody who's working, and there's always going to be bad examples, you know, that's that's, and I can think of shoots and stuff where, you know, the, the mass production scale is just mind-blowing. And I personally, I, I'm you know, sure other people think that's a great day. It's not for me. And I've got issues with the way it's done. That's just my personal kind of call, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, there's so much commonality there. I think that's what kind of got me thinking about this kind of, you know, integrated land use approach was actually a lot of places we were doing surveys on where estates managed for shooting and stalking. <laughs> um, Cause there's a lot of wildlife on it. Yeah, because if you're managing for a sustainable surplus of one type of wildlife, other wildlife's probably going to benefit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, if it's so good true. habitat for wildlife. It's going to be good habitat for wildlife. So, yeah, yeah, um, it's tricky. There's a lot of personalities at play. I mean, without help. going to, into detail on what you just alluded to, I think you know it's something we recognise as well that you know they're, they're shooting in many different forms, and 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 actually, where our downfall is is not understanding the impacts of various types of shooting and sizes and scales and whatever it may be. And actually a lot of the stuff going on is just to try and understand a little bit more detail about what that does, because there are a lot of shoots, which on the face of it, people might go, Oh, that's awful. Doing a really, yeah. really good thing. And, and, and vice versa as well. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people doing good stuff. I think that's the, that's the, I was at a conference that there's a the integrated land use conference held each year in Carbridge in, uh, the Cairngorms and 
I, I got in a bit of a <laughs> a bit of a disagreement with one of the sort of attending students who was sort of going on about um what George Monbiot had said about some landed estates and all the rest of it and it's terrible and it and I said, Yeah, but that's one view, but I said I knew I've just come away from speaking to a landowner across the road for here who's managing for a whole range of wildlife. He's managing the deer. He's got woodland schemes. He's got commercial forestry. He's got old native woodland. He's also managing housing and accommodation for both tourists and local residents without whom you wouldn't be able to come here and go skiing and bird watching <laughs> all these other yeah. things so i said could you tell me that estate's name and he went no i said exactly because that's a good news story you don't hear about that sort of thing <laughs> yeah so i'm interested you've used the phrase <laughs> integrated land management a couple of times now can you just explain what you mean by that yeah it, it's kind of based on the principle that i saw it a lot in in norway quite written quite large which was that a lot of the guys who are the foresters are also deer stalkers and they're also got a little farm and it's kind of that tying together different land uses you know the fish and the, where like i think it working in the sort of conservation land use sector here one of the problems is that people are very kind of very siloed you know they, they are a forester and that's their batch or they are a, a deer stalker or a gamekeeper at that conference i went to it was always quite fun to go to sort of year on year because you could you, they got all the students from sort of North Island College and uh, the Scottish School of Forestry and a few others would come together and you could tell by what clothes people were wearing exactly who was sat at what table you know <laughs> that table's the gamekeepers because they're wearing their tweeds and tackety boots and that, <laughs> that table's the PhD students and that table's the foresters and that one's the the conservation students you know it was and the whole point of the conference is going to get people to mix up but um, it was quite interesting when they first went. It was very much kind of like, you know, we stick with the people we know. Like the school disco. Totally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think people ever really grow out of that sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of, I think I've got an interest in kind of trying to tie all that together, really. That's always been my kind of, you know, like I said, if you're managing managing for a sort of happy, healthy habitats, you're going to benefit a whole lot of other species. But it doesn't mean you also can't, you know, Cut, take a bit of firewood or bit of building materials or you know benefit your fish species or whatever so yeah and it's interesting the attitudes to to conservation as well it, there tends to be a sort of you know put a fence around it and don't go in ever again kind of approach to conservation in this country where it seems that certain groups maybe think that conservation is something that involves no human intervention of any description just everybody bugger off and leave it alone, please, and let it all happen, where that isn't really necessarily a realistic thing to do when you take into account all the other factors that, that come into play, the people and the population densities and of, of people and animals and, and all the other things that need to, that, that, particularly in a small country, small island like the UK. Completely. Well, I mean, it's a it's a hot topic in the Highlands. I think if, if you mentioned rewilding, everybody wants to put wolves in the Highlands, so it's kind of it's something that always comes up. And, oh God, uh, that infuriates me. I, it's just, honestly, it's, it does my head in. It really does. If, if someone <laughs> says that, I, 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 you, you've mentioned it, and I, I was I was going to bring it up later because I wanted to get your opinion on it, but like I, I can't tell you how angry it, it gets me, and I'll tell you the reason why. I've mentioned it on this pod quite a few times, but I'm a trustee of the Country Food Trust, and we do this venison bolognese, which we deliver to people in need in a in a in a ambient temperature pouch. It can sit in the cupboard. It's got a year's shelf life. I actually ate one two years old the other day from a, de- a sample unit, so I can assure you it's you, fine, even for longer than a year. I was going to say you've been saying you've been feeling ill this week. This week, you sure it, wasn't? <laughs> it definitely wasn't that. Anyway, we got um, pouches of, of venison bolognese going out to people in the Ukraine as we speak, and. This comes from Scottish vendors. Well, it's actually vendors all over the UK, but it happens to be the latest batch is all from Highland Games. So it's from, Scot- from Scotland. And people want to put wolves in, the, in this country to, to eat this free range, high protein, low fat produce sitting on our doorstep. And instead we import it from New Zealand and stop it going to people in need so that we can give it to some animal that isn't even in the country yet. I mean, what on earth are they thinking? I, I had a, a discussion based about wolves the other day for a different podcast and 
you know, I said at the end of the day, if if they were honest about the reason for wanting them, which is like they would look cool, then fine. Make that argument, you know. That is the only but, reason, right, isn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. to, but, to, but to suggest that they would, like, be active in reducing deer numbers, no. There's, there's countries all across Europe have wolves now, and countries all across Europe, deer numbers are going up. Wild boar numbers are going up. Hunters can't keep to it, let alone, you know, half a dozen packs of, of wolves, you know. At best, they move them around. But they don't. Yeah. They don't actively reduce numbers. And at, at what? How many would you need to reduce? You know, in Scotland, we're meant to have a million deer. And I'm skeptical of that number, but I probably shouldn't say that. Um, yeah, it's going to be bigger. Already, but we've got a million it? deer. Oh, yeah. And uh, how how many wolves would you need to actually reduce that? When you think Scottish deer managers are shooting, you know, how many hundred thousand deer every year? A lot you know, of two-hour eating wolves. wolves. It's, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, that, that's the other. That's the other point. They, they they actually had a bit on Radio Four this afternoon about wild venison and how we a, a surprisingly positive piece actually. But uh, one of the points that was made is rewilding might be might be worth trying in some remoter parts of the UK, but you don't want wolves in Surrey, do you? That's not going to go down well. <laughs> Can you imagine you know, but... on a dog walk? <laughs> oh my god! Well, Surrey's like ninety-five percent golf courses as well. <laughs> Look, I, I, obviously, Surrey's are kind of out of the question. But even Scotland, like, yes, it's a there's a big remote parts of Scotland, but it's not that remote when you compare it with like some mm. of the other parts of the world where these wolves are. It's actually not, not very at remote at all. Not at all. I, a, the, yeah, I know. I, I find it the most. It's just. <sighs> I said, make the argument that you want them because you want them, but don't make the argument that they're going to have massive ecological change. I don't think they will. I mean, it's like, you know, any animal is going to take the easy route to a meal. And, you know. (laughs) Why chase deer when you can jump on a sheep? If you plant plant a field of ties or or neeps on your croft, you can guarantee that deer will find a way to it because it's a quick and easy meal. You know. Wolves are no different. If you've got half a dozen sheep on your craft, they're not going to bugger about on the hill chasing a few scrawny, winter tired hinds around. They're going to go down to your craft, you know, and uh, or or whatever. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> I'm very skeptical of it. Well, of course, but of course, but I think the average person would be when they've been explained the facts. So I don't see this one winning, but that's my hope for common sense prevailing and i can that see links coming links being child i can see that happening i definitely can see that one happening they're just they're a different prospect they're a lot more kind of keep themselves to themselves generally there's less sort of uh ravaging snarling pack kind of like disney image in people's minds about it you know it's a kind of sort of cute fluffy cat <laughs> and i think folks don't realize kind of what a lot of wild animals are capable of you well, know just in terms say, of physical uh, strength and ability but i mean yeah i can see links being i can definitely see them being trialed but just, but, but for, to what end what, what reason what, what, why should well, we? reducing deer numbers obviously yeah but i mean the ravaging uh, on the horde, ba- <laughs> eating all our trees <laughs> but but on the basis that there's a lot of conversations going on in high levels of government at the moment that actually this amount of high quality protein sitting on our ground could be used for very good effect we need. We. I think we just need to change attitudes towards it, and then go out, get this deer, get these deer numbers under control to, to put the meat into good use. And and yes, during COVID and stuff like that, the value wasn't quite there because of the lack of restaurants. But I can see venison being the last. If, if you know, let's wind forward a hundred years when this world's gone totally mad and we're all vegan. The ven, you know, we'll still be eating venison. It will be around forever. It will be the last meat standing. I reckon. Yeah, if if you know if, that, if that's the case, well, that's black market now underground trade in venison haunch on tape. So when you're <laughs> correct in a hundred years' time, historians will look back at this podcast and think of you as a seer, Chris. <laughs> They'll be like podcasts. That's like that's like the Betamax. What were they? <laughs> <laughs> but they, I mean, Megan, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, particularly with relation to the Highlands, is these, these um, things like the Brewdog Forest and and that kind of thing. Is that another thing that gets your goat, so to speak, the, these kind of big landowners or people coming in and buying up big chunks of land and just doing massively misguided things? Oh, definitely. 
I'm not, again, I'm not sure how much I can probably say on that one, but um, <laughs> fair oh, enough. No, no but, one listens. Um, this is private between you, us. Oh, that's you know. fine. That's fine. Then I'll just, I'll just really let loose. Um, <laughs> it's not like it's recorded or anything. Um, no. <laughs> no, we won't no, put I you. Mean, we're it's... not going to put you on the spot. No, no. Come on, it's not fair, Chris. It's not fair. <laughs> what, what, what do you think about Mr. Mr. Brewdog then, George? Apart from the fact he's not allowed on what's that you're drinking ever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I think that says it all, really. We've had some, we've had a huge variety of drinks on here, and there's never any judgment. But I do think if somebody brought along a brew dog, I'd probably stop the recording and tell them to clear <laughs> off. <laughs> Go on, it's, it's a better drink. <laughs> it's a sad day because the Dead Pony Club, one of their beers, he was my favourite beer for a number of years, and I haven't had it since since he since he went on his crazed, I don't know whatever you want to call it. Oh, that and the fact that it is, I don't know, there's a lot of bad PR about the company at the same time, but yeah. No, I'm not, a, yeah. Not, not a fan, I must admit. I think there's that, um, we were t- talking about it the other day, somebody, and, you know, it's like the whole kind of rewilding thing. A lot of the concepts I'm all for, you know, the actual idea would be hugely beneficial to us, to wildlife, to all the rest of it. But the second people are trying to capitalize on that and make money out of it, get a little bit nervous about <laughs> you know the harris and the wise you know so it's um yeah it's a tricky one i'm kind of in principle kind of like the idea of certain things to do the rewilding you know reforesting certain areas cool you know but habitat restoration great but cashing in on it i find that a little bit kind of maybe things that people are, you know we saw a lot of that in the 70s when people have planted up peatlands that are now being paid to fix with more public money. <laughs> so, you think we would have learned? <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah. I think maybe yeah. maybe kind of look at the lessons learned. And... Maybe that's what the public yeah. money should be spent on. It should be called the not stop dicking around fund. Just pay people to literally just don't don't leave your house. Just stop. Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> There's some truth in there somewhere. Um, just why do why do back a stage, Megan? You've obviously done a lot to to get more women into into to what you do because there's not many female professional stalkers are there any others no, i don't know no there's there's a handful yeah there's a handful yeah um, but there's not many so yeah I, I mean what advice do you have then because i mean obviously naturally we're going to get a lot of our, our audience is relatively strong male dominance uh there but uh, you know <laughs> but the, what advice have you got for for you know thinking like you thought originally and getting more women into into game or venison at least oh god um that's a tricky one actually i think the thing is not to be put off if you are the only one in the room like wolfie's kind of situation is you know you can still have a good a good day if you are the only one in the room but also to be to be aware that you know there are going to be pricks in the world and they're just going to try it and make your life a misery because some of them want to and they can So it's not to say grow thick skin and put up with it, but make sure you've got, you know, access to a kind of your, some of your peers, you know, other women who are in the field sports sector. I mean, that was the whole kind of point of putting this little group together was to kind of, we all kind of met up back in 2019 and had a good chat about, you know, our experiences and, and thoughts. And because some of us are professional stalkers, some people were kind of hobbyists and a lot of us had shared experience of good and bad things. And it was nice to actually be in amongst a group where people go, ah, no, I know exactly what you mean. I this know. is, this is was, hindsight. This is the group you're talking about. Yeah, that about. was hindsight. Yeah. yeah. That was, um, so, I mean, we're, we're very, very low key and very kind of unofficial. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really good thing to have, like I said, peer support kind of thing. Yeah. Networks um, are important, aren't they? Totally. Totally. I mean, if you're doing anything, you need, you need support. And I think there was a, you know, if you are the only one in the room, then it's nice to know that actually, even if they're not in the room with you, you can still go and, you know, have a vent to somebody else who completely gets where you're coming from. It's not a bitching club, I hasten to add. That made it sound really bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it's, yeah, I think it's important to have that, actually. Totally. So, yeah. So, how, think, so how, do, how, do, how does anyone listening get in touch and from a hindsight point of view? Just find me online and we'll 
<laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that all the <laughs> you know links to your Twitter and your website and that kind of thing yeah, are cool. all in the descriptions of the podcast, cool. so people can just. There's a, there is a there is a, like a tab on my website with a little bit more about it and a sort of contact page. So that's probably the best the best route. If this um, was YouTube, I'd say click on the link in the co- in the description below. <laughs> but it's not. But it, the same the same holds true. Yeah. Twitter's your platform of choice, isn't it? Yeah, in yeah, the one that sadly. you sort of focus. On. I know. Yeah, I've been on it for over a decade now. It's horrendous. Um, <laughs> it's but, the best um, one for having an argument on. Oh, totally, totally. Um, <laughs> if you're really up for a squabble and you get completely hacked off with the world, you go on Twitter. <laughs> just, <laughs> well, just, just wail into it, wail into somebody you disagree with, and it's yeah, it's all all's well. <laughs> that's actually a really good point, though, Chris, because not only not satisfied with having gone from from zero to 100 you know vegetarian to professional deer stalker in at least in your headspace in the space of a couple of days you've also then decided to go on twitter and online and talk about it as well you mentioned pricks do you draw <laughs> a lot of hate on twitter or do they do they mostly just keep themselves themselves and you just block them no, to be honest, I mean, like within, like I said, within the field, kind of field sports kind of community side of things, everybody's very supportive. I think it's one of those things you learn who is worth giving your time of day to, <laughs> like all things in life. <laughs> yeah. And there's always, like I said, there's always going to be people who are just a pain in the arse. You know, I, yeah, can't say any more than that, to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, but I, I think... It's it's a, such a big step though because you know if you if you look back at sort of your journey into this to actually then take that final step about being relatively vocal on it and passionate on it online that's the bit that most people don't get to it's a lot of effort it, I it's imagine a huge you, amount of effort I stress yeah, about I, it all the time <laughs> really yeah. oh yeah I mean but but like th- that's the massive hats off to you bit because there's a lot of people that can be vegetarian decide they want to go stalking and then do a bit of stalking fine the next bit is the hard bit. And that's the bit that you are doing really successfully. And, and if so, I can just jump in as well, from the um, from the judging day for the Countryside Champion Award, it was that element, I think, that the judges really picked up on that communication, education side of it that people that made them go, yeah, this is the, the person who deserves this award. That's good. It's nice to know you're not shouting into the void. <laughs> no, you're well, not. I mean, you uh, might. Uh, be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Oh, but you can, you can be sure there's lots of people who read your stuff and don't sort of give a reaction to it, comment, like, whatever it is, uh, and definitely take it on board and, and appreciate what you're doing. I think that, that's an it's a really important thing as well. You know, you've got to look at the reach of some some of this stuff. It's not all idiots with uh, you know who disagree with what you do. Uh, looking at it, there's a lot of people who massively agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> I, when I say that, the, the, the idiots, is, like I said, they're, they're few and far between. I hasten to add. But, you know, it's like I said, they're always going to get them. It, you, it, you, yeah. mu- you must have had some good moments on, on on social media where you've sort of turned people around and changed their thinking. Definitely. I mean, I think for me the big part, and, and you know, it's we see that with people putting pictures up online. You know, I mean, I, I've shared pictures on Twitter and, and Instagram of, you know, shot animals and that sort of thing. But it's having a narrative as to why, what you're looking at, you know, why you're doing it, why have I done this, what, you know, and ha- having a consistent story behind it, you know, and, and reasons for it rather than just going, blam, here's, you know, a gripping grin of, <laughs> you know, someone holding a, a dead animal. Exactly. Respect has to respect for the quarry is something that people bang on about all the time, and I think a lot of people forget about it once they've got once they've got their Instagram app open or whatever it is. They just go, "Oh, look, check it out," and they don't think actually, what does this look like to somebody outside of what we do? Totally, and you, or in, I, I mean, there's to. there's en- enough stuff that I see posted that makes me think, Jesus Christ, like, <laughs> why did you even take a photo of that? Is that something that you're going to look at? You know, when you get home, you can sit in the sit in your armchair and look at that picture. I just don't think you are. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the stuff, like what, unless you're carrying out sort of like predator management, everything that we are shooting is meant to be eaten as well. And you see some stuff and you think, Jesus Christ, you know, <laughs> like I, w- I wouldn't feel that to my dog, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you think if you weren't to be persuading folks that, 
you know, like game meat, whether it's venison or pheasant or whatever, is kind of accessible and, um, you know, good quality and wild and free range. And some of the pictures that you see going about are just, it, it wouldn't sell it to me. And I eat the stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I think, and I it's, think it's, it's definitely got a, it's definitely got a lot better. Uh, I think that oh, over the last, and it, no, you I know, these think. things some of these things are going to take a long time to change the habits and ways of people who've been doing who've been like that for years but you know i now look at it with again with the country food trust hat on thinking well every you know even if you don't want to eat it you're stopping someone in need having it and i just think therefore it's totally unacceptable whichever way you look at it even if you position it differently yeah i mean um, weirdly i but, think some of those sort of twitter pylons you know there was um uh, the lady who went and shot the goat on one of the islands and then settle the line and that kind of thing. I think those have done more to educate people about what and how to post online than any number of, you know, bits of advice that we could put out in an article, say Chris or anything like that. Mm. You know, seeing oh, God, those yeah. reactions makes people go, Oh, okay. Maybe I do need to be a little bit more careful. It does seem to we'd have changed not, a lot. We'd rather not have had them in the first place. Wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, definitely. But for sure. Well, I think, Megan, it's time that we asked you to talk about your desert island shooting, stalking, whatever it might be, experience. So this is the final segment, and we ask our guests every time to talk about their dream last ever trip. Money's no object. Logistics aren't a thing. You can have whoever you want from throughout time come and join you. Li- alive or dead what would you what would you love to go and do oh god um i think world war potential world war three kind of you know excluded then heading to proper kind of wilderness of kamchatka would be pretty cool that would be a big one i think something like you know kamchatka moose would be quite cool <laughs> that would be you amazing know, a full out in the wilds kind of experience i've seen a few folks sharing pictures of it online and i thought yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Like um, proper wilderness, like yes, literally no one for you know several hundreds hours in a helicopter. Of, yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that would be, I'd be up for that. That would be quite cool. On yeah. your own? Probably not, but I haven't got a clue who I'd take with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have plenty of offers. After I know. This. If you said money, no object, you'd have a, you'd have a queue of people going. Oh, I'm your friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, possibly the hindsight yeah. group. I think they need to find a good crack. <laughs> yeah, go go out for a month, get a nice uh, that's base a girl's from trip. which to work. That's from. a girl's trip. <laughs> Absolutely, come back completely feral. Perfect. <laughs> Very nice. Do you know what I like about this segment is that we get such a variety of things. You know, we've had uh, Richard Cross went completely mad, took over Balmoral Barrel Castle. You know, very graciously, I thought said that the Queen could come um and we've had you know everything from i just want to go and shoot you know 20 odd pheasants with my family at home and i think kamchatka might be our most remote so far somebody said they wanted to go to africa and shoot with ernest hemingway and i can't remember who that was but it's just such a such a great variety right (laughs) yeah Yeah. that's good it's good it's nice it shows that kind of um range of what people value in within the sort of hunting shooting fishing side of things whether yeah, it's remote it, it's or a broad church as we've said or whatever that's nice yeah wonderful well megan thank you ever so much for joining us it's been really interesting really fun and congratulations on your award thank you yes thank you, yeah. <laughs> no thank you so much megan and huge congratulations and your trophy will be with you very soon marvelous <laughs> thank you very much no worries right so before we go as per usual there is one final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the very exclusive guns on pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas for us to resolve or by getting in touch to let us know where you've been listening or by sending us your unpopular opinions or any one of a huge number of things that we said will earn you a set of garters over the course of 38 episodes now on which subject We've noticed that there's been a sort of spate of reviews and uh, that kind of thing on various podcast platforms recently. 
so we just wanted to say a huge thank you it does help us reach more people and it also makes us feel really nice um <laughs> a warm and you, fuzzy george <laughs> warm and fuzzy exactly um if you want to get in touch send us an email to pod at guns and if we read it out in the next episode or any future episodes we will send you some garters we will be back in a unspecified period of time with another episode i think we've slightly got our act together again but i'm not making any commitments but until then thanks very much for listening and goodbye Yeah.